You're listening to the Horseshoe Guys with Josh Carney and Jake Arthur. Your quest to find the most in-depth Indianapolis Colts podcast has triumphantly reached its terminus. Be sure to join Colts Nation's deep divers at horseshoehuddle.com, part of the Sports Illustrated Digital Network. Good evening, everyone. I say good evening because we are recording here at about 8.30 Eastern time, but you are tuned in to the Horseshoe Guys podcast. I am your host, Josh Carney, Deputy Editor of Horseshoe Huddle, joined tonight by Andrew Moore, a analyst at Horseshoe Huddle. And this might be the first time you guys have heard my voice in a month, month and a half. <laughs> um, it's pretty wild. I know that, that Andrew and uh, Brandon Moses have been Carrying the torch for us with a Colts podcast uh, here on the SI Network. You can check out that podcast anywhere you get your podcast. YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Spreaker. Is Stitcher still in use? I think Stitcher is still in use. <laughs> um, anywhere. But you guys are doing a fantastic job. Definitely been carrying the load here uh, on the audio and video portion of things with myself and our colleague, Jake Arthur. Uh, kind of tied up. I'll just say that I I moved. Um, I know a lot of people know that I moved from Colorado back to Pennsylvania, but I moved again. Uh, We are finally settled into our house, but enough about me, enough about why we weren't on the air. Fact is we're back. Uh, And Andrew, I'm I'm thrilled to have you here. We're going to talk a little bit here about Colts Jaguars. Uh, I know that you and Brandon previewed it heavily last night. So again, to the listeners, uh, if you want to check out a game preview, head to a Colts podcast. We're not going to touch on it very much because you guys do a fantastic job and went in depth last night. But Andrew, you're going to be in attendance on Sunday Mm -hmm. per usual at Lucas Oil Stadium. You're at every home game. Uh, You also (laughs) braved the elements in San Francisco uh, in a monsoon. So props to you. But uh, what are you looking forward to seeing on Sunday? I mean, obviously this is going to be your first opportunity, probably the first opportunity for the next decade of seeing Trevor Lawrence at least once a year. But uh, what what are you looking forward to seeing on Sunday between the surging Colts and the, uh, I don't want to say lowly Jaguars because they did win last week, but the lowly Jaguars. Well, thanks for having me back on, Josh. And and I'm excited really to see what this Colts team can do because I I like to see the Colts get some momentum as they face another tough stretch in their schedule coming up with games against Buffalo and and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and and so on. So I'm excited to see what they do. Like we talked about last night on our podcast, the the Colts have kind of been gifted here in recent (laughs) weeks with, with the Jets getting a win over over the Bengals, and and so they had to come back down to earth. Well, last week, the Jaguars get a win over the, the Buffalo Bills, and it's time for them to come back down to earth. So I fully expect the Colts to have a good game. I expect the Colts to win the game on Sunday, but I am excited to see what Trevor Lawrence brings to the table because this is going to be a matchup that that the Colts are going to see for, like you said, probably 10 to 15 years. Yeah. And, and Trevor Lawrence, a prospect that was seen coming out of college as the best prospect at quarterback since Andrew Luck, it's going to be interesting to see what he does against this a struggling Colts pass defense. And and not only that, but while the Jaguars are two and six, the Colts and the Jaguars always play very competitive games. Since Frank Reich became the head coach in 2018, the series is tied three to three. So it, they, the game could really go either way, but I am expecting the Colts to to kind of take charge. They know what's at stake. They know they need to win the games that they, they should win, and they need to take care of business on Sunday in, in front of their home crowd as well as they start heading back into a tough stretch in their schedule. Obviously, the Jags have two wins this year under first-year head coach Urban Meyer. Uh, I believe there was a stretch where the Jaguars lost 21 straight games uh, mm-hmm. and uh, the last game they had won in that stretch was week one of 2020 against the the fighting Philip Rivers uh, Indianapolis <laughs> Colts. So, uh, yeah, it's it's very clear that uh, this is an AFC South game. Um, you know, records be damned in a sense. But uh, the last time these two teams met, it was ugly. It, I mean, it, 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 it was ugly. Uh, granted, the Jaguars didn't have Trevor Lawrence then, but uh, – I just don't know that the talent is that much better than it was in that week 17 matchup last year. 
I don't think it is. And and we've seen the guy that torched them last year in that <laughs> final game of the year. He's just ascended to basically superstardom and yes. Jonathan Taylor. I wrote about this earlier, right after the game on yes, Thursday did. night, how Jonathan Taylor, I mean, we, we were talking about him becoming a star. I think he's past that. I think he's a superstar in this league. I mean, when you think of the top five running backs in the NFL, Jonathan Jonathan Taylor it has to be in that conversation at this point mm-hmm. because not only can not only does he have the breakaway speed not only can he run over anybody that that tries to tackle him but he's also developed in the passing game the Colts are really using him on running back screens dumping the ball off and you could just see when he has the ball in his hands anything is possible he can take a a a two yard pass and take it 80 yards down the field. So, so with, when you have that firepower and Jonathan Taylor in the backfield, and then the last game he played against this Jacksonville Jaguars team, he had 252 yards and two touchdowns. (laughs) So uh, if, if they're not, constantly loading the box and trying to stop Jonathan Taylor on Sunday I think maybe the whole Jacksonville Jaguars defensive staff should be fired at that point honestly because I mean that, that's priority one and and I think he's going to have a big game he's obviously going to take the pressure off of Carson Wentz you're going to see the deep shots down the field to, to Michael Pittman T.Y. Hilton looks to be coming back on Sunday as well you're going to have a fully healthy Colts offense ready to go at a, at a Jacksonville defense that while they had a very good game against the Buffalo Bills they haven't been able to sustain that right. throughout the rest of the season right do you I gotta ask you because I, I know where I stand with this but trap games in the NFL do you believe in them Absolutely. I think you teams, do. Okay. I, I think teams do look over other teams. It, it's just kind of human nature. You can try to focus in as much as you can, but there are times where, where you think, Oh, this is going to be an easy win. And, and we've seen it that any team can win on any given Sunday in the NFL. Right. Evidenced by the Jacksonville Jaguars winning a nine to six ball game against the number one offense in the NFL this year in the Buffalo Bills. Never would so, have guessed that. So that's why the Colts really need to take care of business. If they look past Jacksonville, start looking towards Buffalo, we could see an upset on Sunday. But I think the way this Colts team is and with their record, the way it is too at four and five, they don't have any margin for error. They can't afford to look past Jacksonville. They know that Jacksonville has given them problems in the past. And just hearing Frank Reich and Carson Wentz speak this week, they have a lot of respect for this team, even if they do have a two and six record. So I think they're focused in on Jacksonville and Jacksonville solely. And I really think that'll bode well for them come Sunday. That's what I was going to ask you. Like, do you, is there any percentage you see the Colts overlooking this Jaguars team? Because if you look ahead to next week, they're going back to the place their season ended last year. And they, you know, they came up just short in the final minutes. So it, it sounds like you you have overlooking Jacksonville at almost a 0% chance. Am I accurate in that? Correct. I, I I think if maybe the Colts were sitting at maybe a six and three record, you could yeah. think about that. Yeah. But the Colts are four and five and they're tw- they're twelfth place in the AFC, two games back of the seventh spot and the final wild card spot. They don't have margin for error. They cannot possibly look over this team. And I think the leaders of, of this team know that and they're making sure the locker room is focused solely on Jacksonville this week. Yeah, so as, as I mentioned in the beginning here, we're not going to spend too much time on the, the Jaguars game here. Uh, as I said, Brandon and Andrew have just done a phenomenal job here in the last month and a half since coming underneath our uh, SI umbrella here. They broke down Jags Colts about as far as you could go uh, on their, their episode. Uh, we will be sure to link that uh, in the notes here. Uh, but I want to get into just kind of a midseason recap here, Andrew. Um, it's weird to say that this deep into the season, we're at the midpoint. But remember, it's an 18-week, 17-game season now. Um, So we are at the midpoint uh, of the season. Uh, We're recording this as the the Ravens and Dolphins uh, kick off and kind of get us into the week past the midpoint. Mm -hmm. But for for all intents and purposes with the Colts, we are at the midpoint of the season. Sitting at 4-5, and all of the issues, and I will call them issues, the Colts have dealt with, from the endless COVID coverage in the beginning of training camp to the insane amount of injuries to just the highs and lows week to week. Are you satisfied with four and five? I mean, where where, where are you at with this Colts team right now at four and five? 
this Colts team is very frustrating because <laughs> they're, they're they're four and five, but they they probably should be six and three at yes. this point because you think about it, and I think this is what the difference is between a good team and a team that misses the playoffs. And right now, the Colts are on the outside looking into the playoffs, and it's because you give up a huge lead in Baltimore on Monday night, and and you give up a fourteen nothing lead to Tennessee when you had them rolling. You kept Derrick Henry under 100 yards. If I would have told you before that game, Derrick Henry doesn't get 100 yards, you're thinking, okay, the Colts probably win by by two touchdowns. That just wasn't the case. The Titans come storming back, but the defense can't can't hold up their end of the bargain. And then Carson Wentz has his blunders at the end of the game. And and it's basically a two game swing because the Colts could have had could have tied Tennessee in the division standings at that point. And instead, the Titans get another game up on Indianapolis. And now they own the tiebreaker in in future situations. So that's why it's so frustrating because at times you see the Colts play, play very, very well. I mean, even yeah. against the, the Los Angeles Rams, this Rams team that's only lost a couple games this year, the Colts were within three points of the yeah. Rams. And then Carson Wentz gets hurt. We see Jacob Eason absolutely implode on that two minute oh. drive and it sets the Colts back. Then Carson Wentz comes again, plays, plays on those two sprained ankles against the Tennessee Titans. No real shot there. Yeah. And then just the, the brutal losses to Baltimore and to Tennessee at home. That's why I think this Colts team, it's, it's, it's closer than a lot of people think. But at the same time, the margin for error in the NFL is so slim that the good teams and the playoff teams finish those games off. The bad teams give and the, the guys that are watching football in January are the teams that give up those games. So do I think the Colts can become that? Absolutely, I do. But I want to see it first because so far they've shown us that they haven't been able to close out those big games, and and that's what we need to see if we want to have confidence in them making the playoffs in January. Yeah, I think what you said, frustration, just a frustrating team is a great summation of this team. You look at their their five losses – I don't really have one aside from maybe that first Tennessee game where they just had absolutely no shot with Carson Wentz. You know, I'm thankful he went out there and gave it a go, Mm -hmm. but I mean, he just significantly hindered the offense, but I don't think there's a game that you can look at where you're like, Oh, these guys, it it wasn't close at all. Like at all. Um, You know, obviously that, that, that Titans game in week three, for all intents and purposes, that was a very ugly game. Mm-hmm. Week one against the Seahawks. I mean, how many times did the Colts get into the red zone and fail to score? I think they were 0 for 3 in that game in the red mm-hmm. zone. Against the Rams, they had red zone issues again. I think they were 1 for 4 in the red zone. But they they controlled that game throughout. And now you, you look at where we're at here now. The Rams are considered the NFC Championship game, at least one of those two teams, a favorite to get there out of the NFC. Uh, they just signed Odell Beckham Jr. today to add to a ridiculous offense already. The Colts were a bounce here, a bounce there. The Colts win that game. Week three, as I mentioned, the Titans game, that was that was ugly, and we discussed why. The Ravens game, they were up 19 points. Mm-hmm. 19, and they blew that. And that that's probably the toughest pill to swallow. I know we're going to talk about Carson Wentz and and that that week uh, eight game against the Titans in overtime, but you blow a 19 point lead in the fourth quarter. Mm hmm. That hurts. That's, it, it does. And and the funny thing about that is that one wasn't even on Carson. Carson no. Wentz had Carson Wentz had no. 400 yards in that <laughs> game. And he got the Colts into scoring range multiple times. And then you just you, you have the bad luck with Hot Rod having yeah. having a, a stabbing pain in his hip, which I can't even imagine trying to kick a football in the NFL when you have a stabbing pain in your hip going swinging your leg backwards and forward. So I mean, credit to him for even trying to gut it out. But the defense did not do the Colts any favors. The Colts offense did enough to win that game. Mm-hmm. And the Colts defense gave it away. And and I think that's that's kind of what we've seen as the season has progressed. The offense has started to get where we thought they could be. And, and it's, it's honest, it's honestly wasn't a surprise that they got off to a slow start because number one, I mean, Carson Wentz was out all of training camp with that foot injury. Right. 
not only is he coming into a new team, but then you don't have any time with your new teammates in the preseason and right. in training camp. That's just going to set things back even more. I mean, Philip Rivers last year, Philip Rivers didn't even get start get started going until week five or six, and he had a full training camp with yeah. these with his teammates. Carson Wentz didn't have that. Now, what we had talked about on a Colts podcast with Brandon and I was that we expected Carson Wentz to kind of get off to a slow start, but then about around week five or six, like what happened with, with Rivers, Wentz would start to get going. And we've seen that. We've seen him take care of the ball better. We've seen him really excel in the staples of a Frank Reich offense in the in the crossing routes, the the running back screens or the wide receiver screens. He's been excellent in the RPOs. I mean, his ball handling on the RPOs, probably some of the most masterful stuff I've seen. And it fakes out the cameraman. Oh, and even you're watching the broadcast. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what, man, that's the most frustrating thing. Like you watch the games on TV and then you go back and watch on, on Game Pass again. It's like Damn it! Like, <laughs> just let the play, you know, play out before you zoom in, because there are right. times where it's like, yeah, I have no idea what just happened there, because clearly Taylor or Hines does not have the football. <laughs> uh, but exactly. Yeah, mas- masterful. Uh, just that leads me to my question, Andrew, and we'll get into grades here in a second. But the Carson Wentz trade, mm-hmm. you still feel good about it? I really do. I really do because I think Carson Wentz, I think we've seen what we what we can what he can accomplish with Frank Reich and in this Colts offense. I think so far personally to me, he's actually exceeded my expectations. I thought he would come in here and I thought he would probably be a, an average quarterback. And while when he was playing hurt, he and in the beginning of the season it did look like that. Over these last few weeks, Carson Wentz has played probably as about about a top 10 quarterback in this league. And I really feel that. I mean, yeah, has he made mistakes? Absolutely. The two interceptions against Tennessee are, are inexcusable. They really are. Yeah. But but when you see what he did against a Baltimore defense where he was exceptional, I mean, he posted 134.3 quarterback rating against the New York Jets. Granted, it is the Jets. But at the same time, they they beat up on Joe Burrow the week before. So, I mean, Carson Wentz was able to come out and it had no problems. Yeah. So once Carson Wentz has has gotten established in this offense, he's created a connection with Michael Pittman Jr., which we'll talk about him, I'm sure. But he's ascending into a, easily a number one wide receiver in this league. And then you kind of see once the offensive line got healthy, Eric Fisher, while he started out very slow, and I still think he has plenty of work to do. Eric Fisher is finally starting to become a serviceable left tackle. You have Quentin Nelson back. Ryan Kelly is finally healthy. Chris Reed has been a pleasant surprise at at right guard. And and credit to Zach Hicks for for kind of pointing that out before the season started. He was all on the Chris Reed train, and Chris Reed has come in and been been phenomenal. And now when you finally get Braden Smith back, well, Matt Pryor was a serviceable swing tackle. You can just see this offensive line take a next step when Braden Smith is in there. Yeah. I wrote this in my piece about Braden Smith this week that since he's come back, the Colts have averaged one sack a game, and they hadn't done that in the previous seven weeks. And they're also averaging 171 yards on the ground since Braden Smith has been back. That's a huge difference. Do when- you, you you had you had the one sack game. Do you know how many quarterback hits they were giving up in that same span? I do not. I'd have to look that up, but it, it was, it was, it was probably a lot more because in these past two games, cause I've been to both. I've been to, well, this is, this will be my fifth game in a row, actually, if you <laughs> include. So I've had a lot of, I've had a lot of up close looks at the Colts recently, yep. but when I saw them against, uh, against Tennessee and I saw them against the New York Jets. And for the most part, Carson Wentz was kept upright. And, and even against that Tennessee front, which has the Nico Autry, Harold Landry, Jeffrey Simmons, they've got a formidable front. The Colts gave him plenty of time to throw on most instances. And, and it wasn't just Braden Smith, but it was the whole offensive line really working together. And, and I think they're finally starting to play up to the strengths and to the, to the potential that we've seen and we expect them to play at. And I think that just helps Carson Wentz, helps Jonathan Taylor, Naheem Hines. It's the strength of this offense. And when your strength is humming on all cylinders, then you're going to see the success that the Colts have of scoring over 30 points in four straight games. These last five games you've seen, if you had to guess, over under four and a half quarterback hits per game. I would say probably under. 
I would you say it's correct. It is, I was, it is four. I would probably say around around three and a half to four. And, it is and, four a game. And that's that's kind of when you saw Matt Pryor take over for Julian Davenport, which thank, thank God <laughs> I was I was calling for that for weeks. Julian Davenport made me miss LaRaven Clark. And if you had listened to our podcast previously, yeah. you know my you knew my disdain I, for LaRaven you, Clark. I'll tell you what, I blame Zach Hicks for all of that because he wrote that film room <laughs> piece after the Vikings preseason game. Like Davenport could be serviceable. <laughs> I, I think Davenport read that article because goodness gracious. I, I mean, you want to ter- talk about a turnstile at tackle I, that he was the definition of it. Um, right. You know, but yeah, Matt Pryor came in, helped turn things around. And, and as you wrote this week, I mean, Braden Smith is the X factor. He is an elite right tackle. Uh, he has, he has helped unlock this rushing attack. I think you said uh, like 172 yards a game or something like mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. on the ground. You can point to Braden Smith. I know Quentin Nelson gets a lot of love. Uh, I know in some of the film room pieces you've done, Zach Hicks has done. Eric Fisher's been phenomenal run blocking. Mm -hmm. It all starts with Braden Smith. It all starts with Braden Smith. And Chris Reed has been outstanding. Uh, You know, I'm a little sad about Mark Lewinsky, but, uh, you know, he's going into a contract year. It was eventually it was going to happen. But uh, Mm -hmm. Chris Reed has been quite a find. We'll we'll use that to transition into position grades. Carson Wentz. We're not going to touch on, hey, if the Colts are out of it, do they sit him to save that first-round pick? I don't think Chris Ballard cares about that first-round pick. He traded it for a reason. You know, um, he'll give up a first and still have a second, and I'm sure he'll have a maneuver to get more draft picks. He'll probably be a little more active in free agency. I just don't care. I mean, mm-hmm. unless it's a top five pick, then it's like, yeah, he better sit. But right. I think it'll be 15 to 18 if they miss the playoffs. Uh, that, and that dynamic, too, when, you, when you're when you talking about that, I mean, I mean, fans fans like to think of it this way, but this isn't Madden. You, you, no. there's, there's, ex, there's more consequences if you're going to sit Carson Wentz because if you sit Carson Wentz, how does that sit with Darius Leonard? How does that sit with Quentin Nelson? Let, Guys... Let me- Guys that have ankle have had ankle injuries all year. You're saying, "Oh, we're going to keep Carson Wentz," but you go out there and you keep busting your butt with your ankle injuries and, until we end the season. How do you think that's going to sit? With let those me ask guys? you this too: You sit Carson Wentz and Sam Ellinger goes out there and lights it up. How's Carson <laughs> Wentz going to feel? How are Colts fans? I guarantee you, if that were to happen, Colts fans would be saying, "The hell with Carson Wentz. Sam Ellinger is the future." And then right. you've got a Philadelphia situation all over it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Like, you just need to let Carson play because the the more reps he gets, the more comfortable he gets, the better he'll be. But overall, grade the quarterbacks or the quarterback position at this point, A through F. I would give it a solid B to B minus because I, while while Carson Wentz hasn't been perfect, I, I've he's like I said he's exceeded my expectations. He definitely still needs to work on his mechanics a little bit. He does seem like his feet get a little bit lazy at times, and, and he'll miss some throws that he probably should make. But but as far as the overall decision making, I think it's been for the most part pretty good definitely a lot better than it was last year in philadelphia you can see the him building up those connections with with michael Pittman jr with zach pascal with uh, even even mo alley cox who it seems like he is his favorite tight end target and not to mention the running backs that he's Hey, he set himself up with. So I think Carson Wentz, while there is room for improvement, I think you can be excited for what you see in this first year with Frank Reich. And, and I'm also excited to kind of see, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but I'm excited to see what he does next year because yeah. Frank Reich has never had a quarterback for two years in a row in Indianapolis. And that's, that's it's, absurd to yeah, think that's, about. That's hard this to wrap is, my mind around. <laughs> this is his fourth season in Indianapolis, and he hasn't had the same starting quarterback for two seasons. So I'd like to see what he does in another year in Frank Reich's offense, getting more weapons. If, if Paris Campbell can stay healthy, which at this point doesn't seem likely, but if the Colts draft another weapon, sign somebody, just just getting those pieces around Carson Wentz. I'm excited to see what he does. But, yeah, I would give him probably a B to uh, so far for the first half of the year. I, I was at a B minus, and I think I let uh, the, the Titans game kind of cloud my judgment there. I'll be fully honest with that. I mean, he just <laughs> – 
as as Pat McAfee has said all year, he is an absolute maniac <laughs> with the football. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's he's good for one of those. What the heck were you thinking there? And that that Titans pick from his own end zone was that. Uh, but here's the thing: I've seen some fellow media members push on Twitter. Carson Wentz is on pace for 4,400 yards, 30 touchdowns, six interceptions. You know that's fine and dandy. You can take numbers and manipulate them to show anything you want. Mm -hmm. Fact of the matter is there have been some games where he has been the problem. Uh, He has missed some throws. He's had some just complete head scratching plays. I think it's a B minus. I I really do. But here's the thing. He's been aside from some of those turnovers late in the Titans game. He's been relatively smart and safe with the football Mm -hmm. and don't turn the football over. Don't shoot yourself in the foot. And for the most part, he's done that. Uh, so I'm happy with what I've seen. I think he's been a little better than I expected, especially coming off of what happened in 2020 in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I think you and I are in the same spot where he's not the, the clear and obvious franchise quarterback moving forward the next 10 years. He's not the star of this team. He's not a top 10 quarterback because of what he's doing numbers wise. There's concerns. And I mean, you've watched his film every week. Every mm-hmm. Wednesday, or excuse me, Wednesday, you have a, <laughs> you have a piece out. You and Zach mm-hmm. Hicks break down Carson Wentz in depth. Um, there's been some highs. There's been some lows. There's been some just average play across the board. I will take that, and I, I think you're mm-hmm. in the same boat with me. You know, Phillip Rivers wasn't this elite-level quarterback last year. When this team runs the damn ball, they can beat anyone. Mm-hmm. And it that's why it was always so puzzling the first month, month and a half, where Frank Reich is calling 50 pass plays. It's like, well, what, what, what are we doing here? You know? Mm-hmm. So Wentz has done well. I'm glad he's fully healthy. I'm glad he's settling in with some of his playmakers. He's com- he's comfortable and confident in the offense. Uh, you broke down some pieces where he's, he's really done a good job hitting some of those deep crossers. Zach Hicks has done some pieces. Uh, and, and I, I, I think the future is bright with Carson Wentz and he's checked the boxes we need to see. Um, Moving on to running back. uh, I think our, our grades are kind of going to be skewed a little bit because of what we've seen in the last month, month and a half. Uh, But how would you grade the running back position right now? And that's across the board. I mean, obviously I know Jordan Wilkins is no longer with the team, but from week one to week now, Jonathan Taylor, Naeem Hines, Marlon Mack, Jordan Wilkins. And now Deion Jackson, how would you how would you grade this group overall? I, I'd have to give him an A. I yeah. really do because you, uh, you the way the way that Jonathan Taylor has rose to superstardom, it, it, it's it's pretty incredible. I mean, we I, I thought by the end of this year we'd be considering Jonathan Taylor as a top ten top ten back in this league. I really did. We're halfway through the year, and I'm I'm confident in saying Jonathan Taylor is a top five NFL running back right now the way that he can it doesn't take one defender sometimes it can't it doesn't take two defenders it takes three defenders to bring him down that four three speed where he can take any handoff any catch and take it 70 80 yards for a touchdown and then combine that with with what he is doing in the passing game which which really wasn't an element to his game coming out of college it wasn't used too much last year and now he's becoming a great receiving option in the backfield for Carson Wentz as well so Jonathan Taylor, I think at this pace with with the entry to Derrick Henry, Jonathan Taylor should be the favorite to win the rushing title this year and put his name in the running for for offensive player of the year. And, and moving on to Naheem Hines, I mean Naheem Hines is just steady. He's a guy that that will give you that burst. He is so multiple in his roles. Not only can he be in the backfield, but he can he can catch passes out of the backfield. The, the Colts have split him out wide. They put him in the slot. And I don't really want to label Naheem Hines as a gadget guy because he's he's so much more than that. We've seen Naheem Hines, all five foot nine of him, take the ball, run in between the tackles, and, and mow some guys over as yeah. well. Yeah. So when you're talking about that, I think maybe the biggest disappointment to me in the running back group has been Marlon Mack, just because I was expecting a little bit more. He has had some good good opportunities when he has come in, but the fact that he doesn't play special teams, it does look like he has lost a little bit of a step, unfortunately, and that, that really sucks because Marlon Mack is a great guy. 
But and then you have the emergence of Jonathan Taylor, Naheem Hines. There's just not really a spot for Marlon Mack at this point. But overall, the Colts, how dominant they are running the ball and, and how big of an impact it has on this team's ability to win games. A solid A is my grade. That's right where I'm at. Uh, you know, Jonathan Taylor coming out. A lot of people compared him to Ryan Matthews, uh, mm-hmm. former Chargers standout running back. Jonathan Taylor, the thing that stands out to me, and I know that the games against the Texans and the Jets have kind of skewed this number. He's averaging 5.9 yards a carry. I mean, that's Jamal Charles Priest Holmes level mm-hmm. in a single season. Like, it's it's absolutely absurd. And he's doing this. I mean, I, I'm going to look at the stats here. He hasn't I'll... had a single game all year with 20 carries. <laughs> and he's it's at pretty eight, crazy. It's 140 carries on the year. His highest carries in a game was 19 against the Jets. Mm-hmm. He went for a buck 72 and two scores in that game. But like, here's his here's his number of carries from week one to now: 17, 15, 10, 16, 15, 14, 18, 16, 19. I, he's doing it very efficiently. Mm-hmm. I don't think he's got a ton of wear and tear right now, so I think he's going to start really taking off here. But he's you don't have the- to feed him thirty no. times a game like Derrick Henry, and that's that's the blessing of Jonathan Taylor. Is and I honestly I don't want the Colts to give him the ball thirty times a game because I don't want him to run down. I want to be able to keep and hold on to Jonathan Taylor as long as as long as the Colts can here. Yeah. Twenty to twenty five carries a game, I think, is that sweet spot for Jonathan Taylor. And I saw this stat that when the Colts give the ball to Jonathan Taylor, when he has eighteen or more rushing attempts, the Colts are now six and one in his career. When he has less than 18, 17 or less, the Colts are 9 and 8 in his career. So feed JT, keep feeding JT as much as possible because good things happen when the ball is in his hands. Yeah, it's just very puzzling to me. I I still think back on the early portion of the season and I'm like how did this guy not get the football, you know? Um yeah, run the damn ball, guys. Uh mm-hmm. you know, Naeem Hines, I know he signed the contract extension. For the most part, besides the game against the Jets and the Titans on the road, he's been a little bit of a disappointment, but I think he's kind of just not getting the work that he got last year in, mm-hmm. in the offense. And obviously going from Car- from Phillip Rivers to Carson Wentz will, will impact a guy like Hines because one, use the running back significantly out of the backfield. The other doesn't. I think that's mm-hmm. fair to say historically. Uh, Marlon Mack has been a disappointment, and I have to say this, and this is just me talking. This isn't, you know, the views of, of horseshoe huddle or anything like that. I think the Colts did Marlon Mack wrong by not just trading him outright. I don't care what you're getting. You know, this guy, he came back on a very cheap deal. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's viewed as a leader in that room. And he obviously expressed to them, Hey, I want a chance to play. Mm -hmm. And they didn't do it, you know, and now you're looking at, well, he was inactive last week, and you have Frank Reich saying, you know, we love Marlon Mack. You know, he's a very valuable asset to our team. It's like, I get that. That's coach speak. I'm sure he's very valued in the room. Like, I won't deny that. But for an organization that talks about doing right by their players, I think they screwed up here. Trade him for a conditional seventh. I mean, mm-hmm. give him a chance to play elsewhere because now could they cut him outright and not get anything? for him or did they just let him kind of sit and fester and then end of the season hey thanks for everything go test free agency you're not going to get much because you didn't have much of a workload it's just it's Mm -hmm. it's tough for me yeah and i've been i've been kind of thinking about that as well i think a big determinant in that was letting jordan wilkins go i think if and, and i don't know what there's still a bunch of question marks because the Colts haven't said anything. Jordan Wilkins side hasn't said anything, but Wilkins was out with a non COVID related illness yeah, for, wild. for a few weeks. And then he comes back, he starts practicing a little bit. And then all of a sudden the Colts cut him. And, and we really haven't heard any reason as to why we haven't heard on it, what the illness exact exactly was. But but that it kind of puts that question in your mind. Was it the, something with the illness that caused the Colts to release Jordan Wilkins? And I think when you're talking about the running back position, which is so important in this Colts offense, 
if God forbid something happens to Jonathan Taylor or Naheem Hines, if you trade Marlon Mack and now you release Jordan Wilkins, all of a sudden Deion Jackson, who hasn't played a meaningful snap in the NFL, is thrust into a prominent role. And with the Colts already being hit so hard with injuries this year, I'm almost wondering if that played a role into it because I'm sure it did. Yeah. Because, yeah, in case something happens, you can depend on Marlon Mack to go out there and, and be solid for you. Might not necessarily be a superstar, but he can go out there and, and he can carry a chunk of the load. So I'm yeah. probably I'm almost wondering if that had something to do with it. And and that's why the Colts were, weren't as reluctant just to give him up for for like a conditional seventh round pick, like you said. That's fair. I just for me, I mean, it's just it's hard to see because, mm-hmm. you know, Mack was coming off back to back thousand. Yard Great seasons. dude. Great dude. Yeah, the back-to-back thousand-yard seasons look like a legitimate franchise back. Jonathan Taylor falls into your lap. Mac holds him off in training camp, and then tears his Achilles in Week One in Jacksonville, and kind of has not been heard from since. So mm-hmm. I just I feel bad for the guy. Um, you know, I know he's beloved in that room. He's beloved in the fan base, but it's just hard for me to sit here and say they they did the right thing. I think they should have done more and done right by Marlon Mack, receiver. I'm giving them a C plus, and I know that might sound low for you. Michael Pittman on his own, A plus. Like, dude's a legitimate number one. He is exactly what everyone thought he was coming out of USC. It's it, he's clicking with Carson Wentz, making all the big plays. Everything else after that, though, meh. Like T. T. Y. Mm-hmm. Hilton was okay in his return. Um, Zach Pascal's been super solid. Yeah, that guy just. Nothing flashy, just going to do his job every single rep. Paris Campbell can't stay healthy. Um, I mean, Desmond Patman played 20 snaps last week and just a whole lot of, uh, okay. I just, I'm not seeing it. Mike Mike Strawn, didn't really see it with him, um, you know, coming out of preseason. He had a great preseason, but hasn't really done anything. I just, this wide receiver group overall, I just feel like they're missing missing one more piece and i'm sure they'll address mm-hmm. it in the off season um you know through the draft and probably free agency but again aside from Pittman, i mean it's just it's just a whole lot of eh, it's okay right and i would actually agree with you there i would i would give them a c plus as well because you talked about mark michael Pittman jr there were questions coming in if he could be a number one wide receiver in this league we saw flashes of it towards the end of the year and it was can he take that next step i think it's safe to say he has taken <laughs> that next step Multiple. The, kid, the, the kid is ninth in the league in in receiving yardages i think he's in the top 10 in in uh receiving touchdowns as well or receptions he's shown that he can be a legit number one wide receiver uh, but after you're, you're absolutely right after that uh, it's been kind of very up and down ty hilton i was expecting big things from ty this season because when you turned on the film last year yeah ty hilton may have lost a step but ty yes. hilton was still a was fantastic open. wide receiver yeah. And the defense still respects the hell out of T.Y. Hilton. You see T.Y. Hilton completely move coverages, and it gets two to three guys open on the other side of the field. That's why I was so excited to see what Pittman, if he could take this next step, and then having T.Y. Hilton next to him, what they could do and how much they could open up the the deep ball for this Colts offense. And T.Y. Hilton just hasn't been able to stay healthy. And and it it could be father time catching up to him. He's had some pretty bad breaks with that with that neck injury and then coming back and immediately having a quad and hamstring injury. And then a concussion. Then then a concussion. So it's just like one after another after another. And and for a guy in T.Y. Hilton that previously had only missed maybe one or two games a year, if that, it's starting to pile up, which which kind of makes me sad as to see T. Y. Hilton go out like that because I, the more this is happening, the more I'm leaning to T. Y. Hilton retiring at the end of the year yeah. as a Colt. I've also and, noticed Andrew, like it feels like the fan base has turned on him, at least on social media, and that's not fair. I mean, mm-hmm. I, it, it pains me when people are like, "See, I told you he can't stay healthy." It's like he missed nine games in his first, right? You know, right. Eight, what was it? Eight years in the league, and mm-hmm. now he's he, he's banged up. I mean, that happens when you get older, right? Uh, it's just sad to see, like you said, because this right. was an elite level receiver. I mean, we were legitimately robbed of the luck to Hilton connection mm-hmm. for a decade. We we were robbed, like plain and simple. But continue. Right. I, I digress. 
And and the thing is too, I, I think people on social media have a louder voice because at the stadium, <laughs> when when T.Y. Hilton was introduced against the Houston Texans, oh. that's probably the loudest I have heard Lucas Oil Stadium in in a, at least a few years. Yeah. That's the, just the the amount of love that this fan base has for T.Y. Hilton. T.Y. Hilton is a for sure Ring of Honor member. He's in my opinion the third best wide receiver in Colts franchise history behind Marvin Harrison and Reggie Wayne. I was hoping that TY was going to be out there long enough this year to get to 10,000 receiving yards. And and there's still a chance he would have to really come on yeah. here at the end of the year, but if TY Hilton could get to 10,000 receiving yards, the Colts become the first franchise in NFL history to have three players that have over 10,000 receiving yards Wild. with that same team. Wild. So, uh, I'm I'm pulling for TY to get that but then uh, then we talk about zach pascal the always dependable zach pascal if zach pascal is your number three wide receiver you've got a good wide receiver corp i believe but he's the colts number two wide receiver at this point with ty hilton so so banged up and and while zach pascal has been dependable He's also a free agent next year. So the Colts have to be thinking, are we going to pay money to keep Zach Pascal, or are we going to have to move, move on and try to try to find a replacement for him? Then you have Paris Campbell, Paris Campbell, who was coming on again, bit by the injury bug. And, and once, once, it's, it's getting to that point where it's no longer a coincidence. It's no longer bad breaks. The kid can't stay healthy. And, and the Colts, the best ability is availability. And when you're Paris Campbell, you're not available. So at some point, the Colts are unfortunately going to have to move on from a kid that I think has tremendous talent, but you just can't depend on him. And then when you talk about the back half of the guys, I think Ashton Doolin has been my surprise yeah. of the year, to be honest with you. Yeah. He's come in and played some meaningful snaps while while the other guys have been hurt. He He's kind of found a little bit of a connection with, with Carson Wentz, also been a very good blocker in the running game. Desmond Patman finally did come back from his foot injury. And I think with Mike Straw, they're, they're kind of taking that same approach they did with Desmond Patman. They really like his ability, but they're still taking things very slowly with him. They don't want to overwhelm him. They don't want to hurt his confidence. And I'm fine with that. I just want to see that pay off down the line. But I 100% agree with you that this Colts team is missing a consistent deep threat. While Pittman can can challenge him deep, you need somebody like uh, a prime T.Y. Hilton that yeah. just match with Michael Pittman Jr. Because then that will open things up just to a completely another level for this Colts offense. Yeah, they're going to have to address the speed at some point. Uh, you can't have a receiving core of all possession guys that, that don't separate and, and, and don't get deep. Uh, but mm-hmm. tight a tight end at this point. I mean, again, I, I don't want to poo poo things here or be down, but it's kind of a C for me as well. I mean, Mo Ali Cox. They keep talking about we're going to get him involved. We're going to get him the football. But aside from the Dolphins game, I mean, and the, I know he had the touchdown. Was that I think it was against San Francisco? Um, it's just a whole lot of yeah, it's it's fine. Uh, Mm -hmm. Jack Doyle is, has made some plays. Kylan Granson has been mostly non-existent and that shouldn't surprise anyone. Tight end typically for a rookie is a, is a position that they're very slow to produce in the league, but I'm still high on this group. I still like what I'm seeing. It's just expectations that I had at the start of the year to what I'm seeing now. It's, it's an average grade for me. I mean, that's plain and simple. Right. I would, I would go a little bit. I would go just a little bit higher. I'm going to go C plus because I think, I think Mo Ali Cox has come on the Colts, just the way they spread the ball around constantly where unless you're Michael Pittman Jr. and you're Carson <laughs> Wentz's favorite target, yeah. you're not going to see a, an eight catch hundred yard game out of Mo Ali Cox, but I'd like to. But- <laughs> I would, I would too. He's, he's like an angry moose when he's running down the field. And it's an and excellent description. You, you throw it to, you throw it to Mo Ali Cox and he's been very solid this year. He's, and then Jack Doyle, I think we've started to see the, the downfall of Jack Doyle as well. He's just not as productive. Well, he has been the past couple of weeks getting some touchdowns. He, he, the, the more passes are going to Mo Ali Cox at this point. And I've been honestly very disappointed in Kylan Granson because j- just for the simple fact of how the Colts were were using him in training camp, it yeah. seemed like Kylan Granson was involved in a lot of those situations, and we really haven't seen that so much within within the season. You can see that that the kid's working hard though, and the t- and the 
Colts tight ends are a very tight knit group because once Kylan Granson caught that pass over the middle for, I think it was about 20 yard gain yeah. last week against the Jets. The first two guys that ran over there were Jack Doyle and Mo Alley Cox, and they were going crazy for him. So they know this kid's been working hard. They know that he's had some bad breaks and they're waiting for him to bust out, which is good. It shows that the veterans have faith in him and, and trust him, but it still has been more disappointing than not from Kylan Granson's end this year. So I, I would go just a little bit higher because I'm a little higher on Mo Alley Cox getting involved, but still pretty average for me on the year as well. Yeah. I will say this quickly. Kylan Granson has impressed me as a blocker just in terms of his effort uh, and his improved technique in the last few weeks. He can mm. certainly handle himself in line right now. Offensive line, I just want to grade at this point. I think we touched on him a lot early in the show. Um, I, this has been the biggest improvement for me. I, I'm at a B- minus for them right now. Early in the season, I was down around like a D plus because they were just so bad at protecting Carson Wentz. But mm -hmm. they're healthy. I wrote about this earlier in the week. You know, Frank Reich said, um, I believe it was Monday during his media availability, or maybe it was Tuesday. He just said, you know, these guys are healthy and they're starting to get synced up and we're starting to see it. Uh, and he's absolutely right. The film has been terrific uh, the last few weeks. I think the last five weeks or so, especially on the ground. Uh, I'm at a B minus with this group right now. We're getting a lot of the same grades. I'm at a B minus <laughs> as well. And, and I think it's, it's, it's pretty much exactly what you said. They started out really slow. There were times where we were questioning whether this was going to be a success because the Colts had put so many resources and so much money into this offensive line. They weren't reaping the rewards. And then you have the turnstile that was, that was the tackle position with, with at the beginning of the year, Sam Tevy, Will Holden, <sighs> Julian Davenport. <laughs> Two of them aren't on the team anymore. One of them's riding the pine. And then you trade for Matt Pryor, who's been a, a very pleasant surprise coming in as a swing tackle. But but you're starting to see them them gel more. Eric Fisher is slowly, very slowly coming back from that Achilles injury. He's been a monster in the run in the run game. In the past game, he does still have some work to do. Quentin Nelson went healthy is Quentin Nelson, an all-pro right. guard. Ryan Kelly, I think, started out the year very slowly, and I think that was because, again, he was injured with that hyperextended elbow. He needed those reps to kind of get back and play like himself. He's starting to do that. Chris Reed has been a pleasant surprise, and then obviously with Braden Smith coming back healthy as well. So for me, it's a B-minus just because of how slow they started out, but I think if the, we actually can see this starting line stay together and be more cohesive, get more playing time together again, we're going to start seeing them around at A the rest of the year. Absolutely. 100% lockstep with you there. Uh, I think we're kind of going to be similar here with defensive line as well. Uh, we knew coming into the year that uh, they kind of revamped the pass rush entirely from the defensive end position. Obviously, Quiddy Pay started to show flashes against the Jets. Uh, Deo Odeingbo came back, and he's, he's getting his feet underneath him at this point. Uh, but aside from those two, pass rush hasn't quite been there overall. Here's the thing, though. These two guys inside, the starting two guys, uh, Grover Stewart and DeForest Buckner, have been fantastic. Taylor Stallworth is coming on. I'm at a C-plus with this defensive line as a whole right now, mainly because of the defensive ends. And it's not that the defensive ends are just so bad that that's dragging them down, but there's just a lot to be desired there. But inside, not the case whatsoever. Where are you at with this defensive line? I'm a little bit lower. I'm going C minus because okay. I think I think really a, a lot of the Colts defensive issues this year have been twofold. Yes, it's been about the secondary and we'll talk about them here in a bit, but the Colts defensive line still is not getting pressure. Uh, DeForest Buckner is is an animal, an all pro defensive tackle. But he still should not be your number one guy at generating, at generating pressure as a defensive tackle. Grover Stewart, I think, kind of started out slow. I think there were a couple games at the beginning of the year where Grover was was pretty invisible. Last few games, he's been an absolute monster at clogging the middle. And you can see the Colts' run defense kind of coming back and and being a, a massive threat to other teams. And, and we, we talked about this before the beginning of the year. If we expected this Colts defensive line, how they were going to do. And, and I thought that they had a chance to get between 30 and 40 sacks, which I think they're on pace for that. Yeah. But I wanted to see more pressure out of them, not just the sack numbers, but, but making sure that quarterbacks don't feel comfortable in the pocket, even when they're not getting sacks. And there have been too many times this year where the 
court opposing quarterbacks that the Colts have faced have sat back in the pocket and just picked apart this Colts defense because they have all day to throw, whether it is Ryan Tannehill, uh, Josh Johnson, the Jets practice squad <laughs> quarterback last week, uh, Matthew Stafford, Russell Wilson. We can go on and on, but there just hasn't been enough pressure. I, I, I am, I am excited to see what Quiddy Pay does the second half of the year while he doesn't have a sack yet. I think things are starting to come together for him. Oh, he, yeah. had, he had seven pressures last week against the Jets. He was very, very close on a couple occasions of getting getting a sack or two. And, and towards the end of the game, you saw the Jets start to chip him. They they knew he was coming. And and I think once once he starts getting more games under his belt, he's starting to put things together as a pass rusher. He's been excellent against the run. And, and then when you, I think another big part of Quiddy Pay not having a sack yet is he had that hamstring injury that kept him out for a couple games. That definitely set him back. Mm-hmm. Then you have Dio Dangbo coming on. Unfortunately, Tyquan Lewis, who was having a great game against the Tennessee yeah. Titans, just completely blew out his knee. Al Qadi Muhammad for me has been, has been outstanding, has been an, a, a pleasant surprise. But we still need to see more. We still need to see the pre- – if they're not going to get the sacks, we need to see pressures. We need to see it on a consistent basis for for me to consider this this defensive line uh, a success. And, and, I mean, this is what Chris Ballard wanted. Chris Ballard wanted to give these young guys a chance. He wanted to evaluate them this year. That's why he didn't re-sign to Nico Autry and Justin Houston. It was time for, for them to prove it or for the Colts to move on. And I think the Colts are getting their answer – for a couple of the guys along the defensive line. Yeah, it's a shame. Kimoko Ture, Ben Banigou, mm-hmm. absolute zeros at this point. Uh, Zach Hicks did throw out the other day a name that I find very interesting as a potential ad for 2022. Jerry Hughes uh, from the Buffalo Bills as a situational pass rusher. I'd be okay with that, <laughs> honestly. I mean, Quiddy Pay has played the run about as well as a rookie can, and mm-hmm. that was his calling card at Michigan. He's still a very uber raw prospect pat rushing the passer you got to get someone in here though at defensive end that knows how to win and has a deep tool bag of moves and i just don't think anyone has that right now maybe dio odayingbo and quitty pay have that in the future and are kind of that mathis freeney pairing that we kind of hoped for eventually but they got to get someone in here like a justin houston type that can just rush the passer uh, because you can't have these quarterbacks just sitting back and, and picking these guys apart. Fortunately for this defense, they have one guy who at this point should probably be in the discussion for defensive player of the year uh, at linebacker. Darius Leonard is having a whale of a season. He's doing it on basically one ankle. Uh, Bobby Okereke, am I saying that correctly now? <laughs> yes. Um, he is having a, a decent year. He's coming on strong the last few weeks. Uh, Zaire Franklin has played okay in stretches uh, in their base defense, but uh, this linebacking core, basically because of Leonard, I'm at a B plus. I- I'm amazed that at this point, you got to come up with a fun nickname for his punch outs because you know Charles Tillman of the Bears has the peanut punch. What can we call the maniacs? The maniac uh, attack, maybe. I, I guess. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I have a T-shirt of the, the the they called it the clutch punch last year against the Texans. I have that T-shirt uh, uh, of Darius Leonard, but we got to come up with a cool nickname like the, the peanut punch. I know nothing right. really works with Leonard, or <laughs> you know, but it, it's it's incredible, and he mm-hmm. continues to get better. He's still not a hundred percent. He should be in every single defensive player of the year category. We know his limitations, but the dude makes plays. I'm at a B plus. Where are you at with linebacker? I'm at a B, and and but I think with Darius, without Darius Leonard, the, oh. the linebacker play is probably a D minus for me. <laughs> yes, there could be an argument made that Darius Leonard is single handedly saving this defense or keeping this defense alive right now because of all the turnovers that he is generating, not only through interceptions, the constant force fumbles, the constant fumble, the recoveries as well. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty insane to see the slowed down replays where he balls his hand in a fist, locates the fat part of the football and punches it directly. It's, it's, 
I mean, Chris Ballard's talked about it. Frank Reich, his teammates. It's something that is just not seen since Peanut no. Tillman. And and the way, while well, Darius Leonard has been hobbled with his ankle injury, and yes, it has definitely affected him in coverage. You've seen multiple times where, where teams are picking on Darius Leonard in coverage because he's not full speed. I mean, there was a time where he recovered that fumble, and usually Darius Leonard against the Ravens, usually Darius Leonard will take off and should have a touchdown. You saw his ankle start to give out on him, and that's when yeah. he... He actually did lateral it to Isaiah Rogers. It wasn't a forward pass like the refs called, but I won't get on the tangent of that. Anyways, but yeah, I think Darius Leonard has single-handedly been keeping this Colts defense afloat with what he's been doing. Bobby Okereke, he did start out the year pretty slow. He has came on. He's now the leading tackler for the Colts, believe it or not. But you still want to see more out of this linebacking core in terms of coverage because too many times the Colts are given up passes over the middle of the field whether it's the linebackers fault or the safety's fault either way that needs to be shored up and the Colts really need to focus on that if they want to have their pass defense better for the second half of the year but uh Darius Leonard I I can't imagine what he'd be doing if he was 100% healthy with that ankle I think it'd be defensive player of the year running away at this point yeah I mean I know the voters get caught up in sacks and pressures and all that I mean I'm seeing stuff from CBS Sports right now TJ Watt and Miles Garrett in Pittsburgh and Cleveland are the front runners. And it's like, hey, look at Indianapolis. This guy mm-hmm. has nine takeaways on his own. Nine. Mm-hmm. Takeaways are more important than sacks, people. Uh, defensive back, this is going to be painful. I don't want to take too long on this because people know the issues. I'm at a D minus. I mean, this group, I know they're hurt, significantly hurt. This group stinks. You know, Xavier Rhodes, I tweeted this, uh, I believe it was against the Jets. He's cooked. He, he is absolutely cooked, and it's it sucks to see because he was he was so good last year. Um, oh, Zach Hicks just joined our stream. Let's Are we, are we going to add Zach? Hi, Zach. This is, <laughs> okay. this, this is great radio here. Hey, guys. How no, you doing? What's going on? Hey, so I was just recording another show for my other channel and I thought that I accidentally left it live. So I jumped back in. I was like, Oh shit, I got to turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> so, although, yeah. So in short, in short, the Colts defensive backs are atrocious. Start Isaiah <laughs> Rogers, TJ carry to safety. And that's it. That's all I got. That's my, I like that's it. <laughs> in and out. I appreciate it, man. Thank you for joining. <laughs> all right. I almost ended it on you guys too. Cause oh, I thought I left it. That'd have been bad. This is great radio though. I appreciate it, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Bye. Babe. <laughs> <laughs> yes uh start tj carry at safety mm-hmm. isaiah rogers cornerback one or two depending on how you feel about rocky sin d minus man uh th- this group is as bad as it gets i don't think that's hyperbole i mean julian blackman going down he was playing elite level football uh before he got hurt kari willis has been banged up all year hasn't been very good rocky sin has taken a step forward but he's still inconsistent I just, this group is bad. And I think aside from maybe receiver, this is going to be the group that undergoes the most changes in this offseason. Chris Ballard is going to be scouting the top cornerbacks across the country. Probably, he's probably doing it already. Uh, This group is bad. What's your grade? I would go D minus as well, close right. to an F. And yeah. and it's 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 pretty despicable when you look at it, honestly. Xavier Rhodes, not only is he cooked, I don't think he's trying anymore. There's some plays where he's he's making not not even half attempts at, at tackles anymore. There's way too many times where a quarterback of his standing, a veteran of him being in the league for over 10 years now, almost almost 10 years. And he's being that confused on defense. It's inexcusable at this point. And, and the Colts bet on on Xavier Rhodes after he had a really good season last year. I, I don't blame the Colts for for trying to re-sign him. I was a proponent of signing Xavier Rhodes because I thought that he was he was kind of having a renaissance in Indianapolis. He was showing that he still had it. He was being a much better zone defender. And all that's going out the window. And I know he's been banged up, but at the same time, everybody's banged up. You, yeah. you as a veteran, as an eight year, nine year veteran in this league, you got to play through it. So I think Xavier Rhodes has been a major disappointment. 
Rocky Sin, I've been fairly, uh, su- very surprised with, actually, because yeah. in my opinion, Rocky Sin has been the best cornerback for the Colts all year. And I mean, while, while he still gives up a touchdown here or there, I mean, the penalties on Rocky Sin, almost completely gone. He doesn't really give up big plays. And, and say what you will about Rocky Sin, at least he fights on every play. He doesn't give up like Zay- we've seen Xavier Rhodes do. Kenny Moore, we've seen take a step back, unfortunately. And I don't know if that's just because of what's going on around him. I think it is, honestly. It, it seems like Kenny Moore has more responsibility in that back end, and it, he can't do it alone. And and then when you get to the safe, safety position, man, it's it's been a wild and disappointing ride because – Julian Blackman, you're, you're absolutely correct. He was coming on. He's an absolute playmaker on this defense. And he's a guy that, that changes how, how offenses attack the secondary when Julian Blackman is roaming around out there, not only in the deep secondary, but we saw him come up and tackle Derrick Henry one on one and, and put a lick on Derrick Henry as well. Kari Willis, normally solid. He's been hurt all year, like you said as well. And I think that's played a role into his bad play. And then the Colts just, they, they tried to address the safety depth this offseason by drafting rookie Sean Davis and, and signing Sean Davis in free agency. Neither Davis is with the team. And now the Colts are relying on Andrew Sandejo, who has not been good, and George Odom, who there's a reason he's played special teams for the past two years. Yeah. It, it puts the Colts in a tough situation because, yes, injuries happen in the NFL. But at the same time, it just seems like there's a lot of things with this secondary that that have gone wrong, and they they can't seem to stop anybody. I'm not going to put that all on the defensive backs. I think some of it has to do with the scheme and and Matt Eberflus refusing to let his wide receivers get hit, or his cornerbacks, excuse me, on a wide receiver more than and having them off about ten yards off of coverage every play. But at the same time, the, these cornerbacks have not been able to do their jobs. They haven't been enough playmakers. The safety play outside of the starters has been atrocious, and it's been a huge detriment to this Colts defense. I, I do think a lot of these issues this year are correctable. Um, moving on from Xavier Rhodes and finding you know, a, a long, lanky corner, whether that's in free agency or in the draft, they have a guy that they like in Bo Pete Keys, although he's been a mess. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I do think Isaiah Rogers and Rocky Sin can handle the starting outside duties next year, especially early on. I, I also think a lot of Kenny Moore's struggles are due to the the just revolving door at safety. Uh, he does have more responsibility on his plate this year, and I think he's just trying to do a little too much, mm-hmm. uh, and it's it's hurting them. Uh, I don't. I think we've talked a lot about Matt Eberflus's scheme on the site, on podcasts, on streams. He just doesn't adjust enough for me, and he doesn't play to his guy's strength. It's just, this is my scheme. Make plays in the scheme it's called, and it just doesn't work. Um, like the Ravens game. He just did not adjust. He didn't adjust, mm-hmm. and he 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 handcuffed his 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 playmakers in that fourth quarter, and it, it killed him. Uh, but, yeah, th- there's no denying this, this secondary has been as rough as it gets. Uh, good news is, though, Chris Ballard knows how to evaluate these guys, um, and I, I think it can be turned around quickly next year. Special teams, just really quickly, I'm going to be plus with these guys. Rigoberto Sanchez has been one of the best punters in football. Uh, Hot Rod, I know that he struggled um, in that Ravens game. Is close to coming back from IR. I know Frank Reich said this week it'll be Michael Badgley again, um, but Hot Rod is close. Um, when he's healthy, He's consistent. Doesn't have a huge leg, but he's consistent. Uh, it's a B plus for me right now. They're just not getting a lot out of the return game, which is a little disappointing because Naheem Hines last year was an elite punt returner, and he's just not getting the opportunities now. Where are you at quickly on, on special teams? I'll give it an A minus, and strictly because you don't really have to worry about special teams with the Indianapolis Colts. Right. Rigoberto Sanchez is a two-time AFC Special Teams Player of the Week this yes. year already. Uh, Hot Rod was was perfect before, or next to perfect. I think he had only missed one extra point before the Ravens game. So, and then Michael Badgley has stepped in and, and been a very good replacement. And as well, the Colts don't give up yardage on special teams. They're a very solid tackling special teams. You would like to see a little bit more out of the run, out of the return game but you just don't have to worry about special teams with the Colts and you know they're going to be solid in in every single phase of of that side of the ball I whisper this into my mic in regards to Rigoberto Sanchez Pat McAfee who (laughs) (laughs) no I I, I kid I kid Um, I want to get into this though quickly 
Uh, I want your three choices here. Team MVP, Colts Offensive Player of the Year, Colts Defensive Player of the Year. I know that the the Offensive Player of the Year, the Defensive Player of the Year might be obvious. I think I might catch you off guard with mine, though. So give me your Team MVP, your Offensive Player of the Year, and your Defensive Player of the Year. Okay, so my Team MVP, this one might be a little surprising. I'm going to go Carson Wentz. Strictly because I think if Carson Wentz isn't playing how he's playing, I think the Colts are, are a lot worse off than they were. There was just so much, so much questions surrounding Carson Wentz before, before the season. I think he's really answered a lot of those and he's played pretty well up until this point overall. I mean, yeah, you're still going to have the, the Farvian moments where he's yeah. going to try to make a play and, and, and he's got that Andrew Luck quality in him where every play could end in a touchdown. But but you also see his brilliance as well, making plays with his legs, the RPO game, being able to hit those deep shots to Michael Pittman Jr. down the field. So I think he was my team MVP, and especially you can you just saw the difference when he came out. Jacob Beeson came in. This is a completely different team. Without Carson Wentz, this team is probably one of the worst in the league. Yeah. Uh, offensive player of the year. Pretty simple, Jonathan Taylor. I think he's got a case for offensive a player of the year for the NFL. He's going to be the rushing winner. Uh, the, he's going to win the rushing title this year. Excuse me. At this point, is what my opinion, and and I think he's well on to uh, an All Pro nod as well. And then defensive player of the year. I think I kind of alluded to it earlier, Darius Leonard. Without Darius Leonard, this defense is even worse off than they already are. Nine turnovers. I think it's four interceptions at this or three interceptions, four force fumbles, four or five fumble recoveries, just an absurd amount. And and it's 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 pretty marvelous to see what Darius Leonard is doing while injured, while having an ankle injury that's probably going to require surgery to get fixed after the year. And and I think he has been the absolute rock for this defense. I said mine were going to surprise you, and this is full disclosure. Andrew's picks are the correct ones. They will win those <laughs> awards from the Colts. I am doing mine to just kind of have a conversation. Again, it is a podcast that, you know, great radio, Josh. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> team MVP for me, it's DeForest Buckner for me. I know he hasn't had the best year. And I'm going to make the case for him for defensive player of the year as well. Here's why. Okay. This man gets double and triple teamed almost every single rep. Mm -hmm. He is a team captain. He is as impactful as an interior defensive tackle can be. He's not Aaron Donald. He's not Cameron Hayward. I get it. This man eats up blockers. He's constantly on the field. He's a team leader on and off. He, he faces the tough questions. You know, he's always saying the right things. I think he's going to start to take off here now that everyone around him is healthy, gaining more experience. Grover Stewart's play has, has ticked up significantly in the last few weeks, but to go out there every single snap and know that you're going to have two people hitting you or three sometimes and a back chipping you out of the backfield and you just have to continuously eat that for the betterment of the team. He doesn't complain. He's worth every single penny. Uh, I, I wish he was in a defense where he saw a single, you know, a, a single blocker every rep because who boy, the damage <laughs> he could do. Uh, he's starting to play the run a lot better. I think he's starting to have a little bit more juice rushing the passer. I think he's going to just make more plays. And I think the more plays he makes defensively, the better guys like Darius Leonard are, the better guys like Kenny Moore and Isaiah Rogers and Rocky Sin are. And I think the more plays Buckner makes, the better that defense gets, the more games the Colts win. So he's my team MVP and the defensive player of the year. Uh, I think there's a lot that he does to the naked eye that uh, doesn't get enough credit. Uh, but again, like I said, Carson Wentz is your team MVP. Darius Leonard is your defensive player of the year. Don't don't get what I just said twisted. Like Andrew's picks are 100 <laughs> accurate. Offensive player of the year, Andrew's 100 right. It's Jonathan Taylor. For me, it's Michael Pittman. We knew this I team like could run the football. We we knew that. You know, I, I think it took Frank Reich four weeks to go. What the hell am I doing here? Run the damn ball. You know it works. Mm -hmm. Michael Pittman though, he has become a legitimate number one receiver, like we talked about. A legitimate number one, not a, mm -hmm. uh, he's a one or a two. He's a, no, he's a one. Mm -hmm. He makes plays. Uh, you know, he's going to win you contested catches. He's going to create some separation over the middle. He is just as, as sure-handed as it gets at this point. Uh, you know, teams are starting to scheme to take him away, and he's still making plays. He is my offensive player of the year. 
Uh, he has answered every question we had about him. I know that there's that clip circulating uh, of myself and, and Zach Hicks on a preseason pod. What do we need to see? And one of it was Pittman becoming a number one. Answered every single question. Mm-hmm. He is my offensive player of the year. But it, it's Taylor, especially if Taylor. I, I think Taylor has a real shot to crack 2,000 rushing yards. And wouldn't that be something? And that leads that, me. That would be exceptional. His 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 schedule down the stretch, along with the Colts' schedule, is not easy, which we'll get into now to preview the second half before we wrap this up. But man, if Taylor gets two thousand yards, <laughs> wow! So <laughs> I mean, it starts this week with Jacksonville. He could have a monster game. He needs one hundred and seventy nine yards to hit a thousand on the season in Week Ten. I think he could do it. I really think he could do it this week. And then after that, you've got week 11 at Buffalo, week 12 home against Tampa Bay, which I believe Robert Mathis goes into the ring of honor in that game. He does. That's going to be a, a very packed Lucas Oil Stadium on that day because not only is, is Robert Mathis getting going, going into the ring of honor, um, Tom Brady's back in town. And yeah. Robert yeah. Mathis hates Tom Brady. <laughs> so you sure you, you be sure he's going to give a fiery speech at halftime. Can, can Robert Mathis rush the passer for one week? Can we, <laughs> that'd be nice. So yeah, week 12 home against the Buccaneers week 13, December 5th at the Houston Texans. That uh, should be a win again. Uh, week 14, the Colts get a very late buy. I mean, mm-hmm. Andrew, I can't think of a later buy that this team has had. I mean, obviously an extra week, but Wow. Without the the mini bye week with the Thursday nighter against yeah. against the Jets last week, this Colts team would be very tired, and I think they're going to be ready for that bye after Houston. So, and it works perfectly because weeks fifteen through eighteen are are, are kind of tough. I mean, week fifteen, you come back and you face the non Tom Brady New England Patriots mm-hmm. uh, at Lucas Oil Stadium. That I believe uh, they don't have a time for that yet. I would assume that's probably a one o'clock kickoff. Yeah, they're still I think it there's it might that might get flexed. It was either supposed to be on the eight the Saturday the eighteenth or the nineteenth still. So yeah, they, they don't even have air. a date for it. Yeah. So uh and then week sixteen at the Arizona Cardinals on Christmas Day uh at eight fifteen PM. Week seventeen you open twenty twenty two with a matchup at home against the Las Vegas Raiders. And then week 18 on January 9th, Sunday, January 9th, you close the regular season at the Jacksonville Jaguars. So sitting at four and five, let's say sitting at five and five after week 10, we are dangerously assuming a win against the Jaguars. But we talked about that early in the show. It should happen. If not, something went terribly wrong. Weeks 11 through 18, including the bye week. At five and five, how do you see the Colts finishing the year, knowing what we know about this team right now? I I think they could finish. If they're sitting at five and five, I could see them finishing that leaves seven games left. I could see them finishing five and two. I could see them finishing at, at ten and seven. And if they do, I think they're gonna be right on the cusp of that that final playoff spot because I think there there can be some upsets in there. I do think they can beat the Las Vegas Raiders. Uh depending on what team shows up against the the Arizona Cardinals, seeing the Colts play good teams well, it's just can they get over the hump? Uh, we'll we'll see what they can do against Buffalo. I mean, Buffalo just lost to to the Jacksonville Jaguars. They're not, and, and the Colts probably should have won that playoff game, that wild card yeah. game in Buffalo. So the, the Colts know that they can beat Buffalo. They just have to go out and prove it. And then against against Tampa Bay, I, I mean, who knows what's going to happen? You could either have the Tampa Bay game where Tom Brady goes thirty for thirty and doesn't oh, have a Lord. single incompletion, or you could have the Colts pull out a victory like the saints just did over the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So I think as long as the Colts take care of the games that they're supposed to take care of the Houston's, the Jacksonville's, uh, the, the, I think I'm missing another team in there. Uh, Patriots, the Patriots, the Patriots. Uh, Those are the teams that they should take care of. And then they, if they can come out on top on the road against a Buffalo or against an Arizona, or maybe even pull off the upset at home over Tampa Bay. I think that the Colts will will rebound and can be on the cusp of a playoff spot because they are getting healthier on offense. And, and I think there will be some some improvement along the defensive line with the younger guys as the season goes along. But again, it's kind of like what I was saying earlier. 
you got to go out and show it because we've seen them compete with the big dogs, with the Baltimores and the Tennessees, but you got to finish. You got to have that killer instinct. And until they do, that really puts me on the fence of where this Colts team can be at the end of the year. I I think these next two weeks, not counting week 10 against the Jaguars, week 11 at Buffalo, week 12 home against Tampa Bay. That's your turning point in the season. Mm -hmm. You win that game at Buffalo. I don't even care what happens in that Tampa Bay game. You could lose that game 38 to nothing, and I'm fine with it because that's a juggernaut team, let's be honest. And seeing the potential secondary try to cover Antonio Brown, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, uh, Rob Gronkowski. like I'm not looking forward to it, that's for sure. No, I mean, enjoy the greatness. I know it pains me to say that. Enjoy watching the greatness that's on the field that day. But if they win that game in, at Buffalo in week 11, I don't care what happens week 12 because then you're at 6-6. Six and six, You've got to win four games in the last five weeks of the season. Well, last four games. Um, I said that wrong. If you're at 6-6, six and six, you've got Houston. Five so games left. Yeah, so you're at Houston. You're 7-6 and six heading into the bye. Then you've got the Patriots, the Cardinals, the Raiders, and the Jags. Mm-hmm. You've got to win three of those games. To because uh, I think it's ten and seven get you into the playoffs as the final wild card spot. I really do. Uh, so you got to win three of the last four. I think the Patriots are very beatable, especially with the way Mac Jones is playing right now. It, it, people are saying, "Oh, he's he's the next guy in, in New England. He's Tom Brady light. He's he's a game manager. He's, mm-hmm. I loved Mac Jones coming out. I thought he was a legitimate prospect. I still think he is, but right now he's a game manager. That's a run heavy team." Hey, Mac, don't screw it up for us. We got a great defense, a great run game. Mm -hmm. I think the Colts can win that type of game. I don't think they can beat the Cardinals, especially if Kyler Murray's healthy. So I'm chalking that one up as a loss. I'm chalking Tampa Bay up as a loss. Las Vegas, I mean, I think that team goes into the tank because of everything they've dealt with so far this year. John Gruden, uh, you know, the, the absolute mess with Henry Ruggs. Now they just added Deshaun Jackson. I mean, uh, that team has to go in the mm-hmm. tank, you would think. That's a win. They beat Jacksonville to close the year. I'm circling that Buffalo game. You go on the road and you win that game, you're you're getting into the playoffs, in my opinion. So I, I have them getting the 10 wins if they win that Buffalo game. If not, they're a 9-8 and eight team. I think they missed the playoffs. They have a draft pick, go to Philadelphia in that 15-18 to 18 range. and. Mm-hmm. We start all over again in 2022. Um, yeah, the, the next two weeks after this Jaguars game is, is your turning point. And I know probably people listening to that are going, yeah, no duh, of course. But like, <laughs> that's just how it is. I mean, because after that week 14 bye week, that schedule is not as daunting as it may have been, I don't know, beginning of the season or, or, or four weeks ago. Like the only mm-hmm. one I'm worried about is the Cardinals game because mm-hmm. the Cardinals to me are a legit Super Bowl team. Mm-hmm. So. Colts have to handle business on the road in Buffalo. I know that that was a game that uh, they should have won last year in the playoffs. I know a lot of the guys on the team thought they should have won that game. Uh, I think they're playing better football right now than they probably were to close last season, in my opinion, just because of the emergence of Michael Pittman uh, and the health of the offensive line in general. But uh, if you go into Buffalo, Andrew, and you win that game, all bets are off, in my opinion. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, it'll be an interesting second half of the season, uh, especially because Buffalo kind of took a step back and seems to be having a little bit of issues offensively with no run game to speak of. So I think we're both kind of the same spot, 10 and seven. That's how they kind of close the season. Yeah, I think 10 and seven. And uh, they're at this point, they're going to need some help just because yeah. there's so many teams ahead of them in the AFC. They're currently sitting at 12. But at the same time, the, the, a lot of those, some of those teams are in front of them, like like uh, Las Vegas, like New England. You get the yeah. wins over them, you get the tiebreakers, and, and some of these teams aren't going to stay in there, especially like the NFC North and or AFC North. Excuse me, AFC yeah, just, North is such a tough division yeah. to be in. I mean, all all four teams are, are up there fighting for playoff spots. So so the Colts are going to need some help, but I think if they take care of their own business, they could receive that help as we go along in the season. Yeah, the AFC North is just going to beat the crap out of each other. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I think the winner of that division is probably a nine-win team. So I think that opens up a wild card spot, to be honest with you. Uh, 
yeah, the Colts need some help, but they've also got an opportunity in front of them to take care of business and, and help themselves. And, uh, man, if Frank Reich learned anything as a head coach in 2018 after a disastrous start, he's got to apply it this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's just got to turn on the tape the last year. Like, look, guys, we weren't very good the first five, six weeks of the season. We turned it on late, made it to the playoffs, and we were in a game we should have won. And uh, I think this team is kind of on par with that group. So we'll see. It's going to be a lot of fun. I know tonight was a lot of fun, uh, except for talking about the defensive backs again. (laughs) But, uh, Andrew, you will be at the game on Sunday. I know you and Brandon will do a podcast uh, either Sunday night or Monday. I'm not sure Mm -hmm. what your schedule is at this point. Um, But you will do two podcasts next week, previewing or reviewing the Jags game, previewing the Bills game. Mm Mm-hmm. You will have a number of articles next week, <laughs> as will I. Uh, hopefully, we're talking about a win and uh, keeping this train rolling. But, man, thank you so much for joining me tonight. This was an absolute blast. Just drop your Twitter handle where people can find you. Yeah, so you guys could find me at Andrew Moore SI. And uh, if you want to follow along with the pod, you can also follow at a Colts podcast. Pretty simple. If your friends love listening to talk about the Colts, and you like listening to the podcast, tune into a Colts podcast. It's pretty simple. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what, what Lucas Oil Stadium is going to bring this weekend. It's probably going to be have a lot of energy in there. The Colts know they need to beat Jacksonville, and uh, I'm excited to see, excited to see how Sunday goes. Yeah, Thanks I, for having I, yeah. me, Josh. It was a lot of fun. Absolutely. I'm excited to see what happens in that game. But you can follow me on Twitter at by Josh Carney. Check out Horseshoe Huddle. Uh, it's si.com slash nfl slash colts or just google horseshoe huddle we pop up immediately uh you can follow this show at horseshoe guys on twitter you can get us anywhere you get podcasts just search the horseshoe guys podcast uh and yeah follow zach hicks jake arthur andrew myself brandon moses on twitter uh you can check out all our work all week long horseshoehuddle.com we are a well-oiled machine at this point but that's going to do it here uh, for the thursday night show Colts-Jags coming up Sunday, 1 o'clock inside Lucas Oil Stadium. See you then.